Okay, I think we're going to get started. Um, since it's now 8.02, my apologies. Um, I'm Chris Conrad, I'm one of the PGY3s, and I'm going to be presenting today a case that I saw on call and that has kind of circulated through the neural ophthalmology clinic and also one of the retina clinics. Um, and I've entitled it Complicated Optic Disc Edema, and you'll see why. Uh, I've kind of changed the title from what's on the flyer just to make it a little um, less obvious, but um, uh, kind of the story. Change the names to protect the innocent. That's right, exactly. To protect the innocent. Um, and so this was a 13-year-old girl um, that I saw on a Thursday night that presented um, to primary children at the hospital with a 10-day history of vision loss and what she initially described as right much greater than left. Um, her past medical history was significant for Hashimoto's thyroiditis. Um, and then a remote history of headaches, hadn't had a he headache in what she describes as years. Um, and then also a BMI of 37, but was otherwise uh, healthy, not taking any medications. She said that this vision loss uh, developed while she was reading a book at school. Um, that literally within a minute went from clear vision in her right eye uh, to extremely blurry vision to the point where she could not read the book any longer and really see even the clock at school. Um, she also endorsed metamorphopsia, but otherwise um, didn't really endorse any other kind of symptoms. Um, denied headaches, I asked her probably a half dozen times in the ER that night. Um, the neuro-ophthalmology staff, as you can guess, asked her the same thing the next day. Um, she also denied a pulsatile practice, uh, any sort of recent weight gain, at least within the last six months, but prior to that, had endorsed, uh, I think it was a 50 pound weight gain, um, and denied any medications, any changes in medications, and was not currently taking medications at the time. Um, her story, um, to expound on a little bit further, so 10 days uh, prior to when I got to see her as uh, the resident on call, um, she, seven, or I guess seven days prior to that, was seen by an optometrist in the community who noted bilateral disc edema and referred her to a retina specialist. Uh, the exact story there's a little, I'm not quite for sure the exact story because this is all outside of our system. Um, a retina specialist then saw her uh, one day prior to me seeing her in the ER and agreed there was bilateral disc edema um, and then noted some subretinal blood. Uh, so referred her to Primary Children's Hospital for further evaluation of this bilateral disc edema mainly for an MRI and um, uh, a lumbar puncture because he couldn't get her into a neurologist uh, to be seen within a month, um, is what they were saying was the earliest appointment. Uh, so prior to me even seeing her, or I guess in the process of me seeing her, she underwent an LP with an opening pressure of 41. Uh, CSF labs would basically become unremarkable over the next 24 hours. MRI brain was unremarkable, um, and then of course uh, we were consulted for disc edema and kind of further evaluation. And Chris, just for those in the room, what is the opening pressure so, of the limit? Yeah, so normal opening pressure, 20 to 21 would be normal, so it's extremely Uh, so then on bedside exam, she was 2400 in the right eye, 2020 in the left eye. She had an APD in the right, extracular mobility was full. Um, she had a central scotoma in the right eye that was large enough that I could pick up on visual <coughs> fields. Um, she had an IOP based with 20 in both eyes, and then the anterior segment was unremarkable. Uh, so on dilated exam, and I'll show you some photos of this here in just a second, but she had a bilateral optic disc edema right worse than left, uh, and then she had scattered subretinal blood and fluid that basically emanated from the disc and tracked into the macula and almost underneath the fovea of the right eye. Um, and so we can see here um, those images, so bilateral disc edema, um, then subretinal blood, um, and then I'm not going to mention it now, but I, I think looking back on these photos, this wasn't as readily apparent, but there, it looks like there may be a neovascular membrane that was not easily discernible in the ER um, or even basically the next day on the land. Um, and otherwise, fairly unremarkable besides the kind of findings that I've already mentioned. Uh, so at least at this point, um, we've kind of ruled out several things on um, the differential 
differential diagnosis of bilateral disc edema. We had tossed around at least Thursday night that maybe this was pseudo edema, but we had an opening pressure of 41, so that was elevated. Um, pseudo edema related to optic disc drusen. Um, IIH, uh, this would be a very, very scary IIH presentation, possibly needing fenestration um, that night if it was all related to IIH. Uh, we've already kind of ruled out an intracranial mass lesion, CNS infection, we've done the same. Uh, the imaging staff or the neuroradiologists felt like they could adequately rule out any sort of thrombosis. Um, and so then I kind of add this last point um, because we were kind of trying to explain the, all of the subretinal blood and the significant vision loss in a patient that looked like a straightforward IIA patient. Um, and so we basically thought, well, maybe there's a pearl in the vascular membrane, maybe it's related to some pseudo edema, but we have an opening pressure of 41. So we weren't quite for sure exactly what was going on with the um, limited imaging at that point. So we brought her back the next day to the neuro ophthalmology clinic with Dr. Degree and Dr. Neufeld. Uh, we did a visual field that had an enlarged blind spot in the left eye. Um, and then in the right eye, um, we had to do a Goldman visual field due to her poor visual acuity that noted this large central scotoma. Um, we then did a B scan to look for calcified drusen, or I should say Dr. Harry did a B scan um, looking for calcified drusen. It uh, has an elevated disc, but no obvious calcified drusen um, to support uh, kind of optic nerve drusen. Um, then we did an FA that kind of sealed the deal um, at that point. And I'm only showing the images in the right eye because the left eye was unremarkable. Um, but kind of that green discoloration we saw in the photos, like I said, it wasn't near as apparent um, on exam. Uh, you can see that this uh, area of leakage, this uh, kind of paratapillary um, lesion here that progressively leaks as we go farther into the FA, suggesting a, a neovascular membrane. Um, then we did perform an OCT uh, that was kind of consistent with everything uh, that we've already shown and mentioned. Um, so swollen nerve here and fluid that basically tracks all the way in uh, to the macula and almost underneath the phobia. Uh, so then um, the, we'll talk more about this, but we started her on Diamox for IIH, advocated weight loss, and then referred her to retina for this paracapillary neovascular membrane, um, presumably for a vast uh, so she was seen that afternoon by Dr. Hartnett and Dr. Feist, um, underwent a single Avastin injection, and we'll talk about that here in a second, um, with resolution, or at least near resolution, of the subretinal fluid a month later, and visual acuity that went from 2,400 count fingers range to 2,040 within a month of a single Avastin injection. And that's not uncommon for these cases, and Dr. Feist wanted me to point this out, that she's fixed by Feist. <laughs> um, so then on visual field, and it's kind of hard to compare to the Goldman visual field uh, in the right eye at the first, pre at the initial presentation, but she has this kind of enlarged blind spot with uh, kind of tracking into the central uh, visual field, and then resolution at this point a month later of the enlarged blind spot in the left eye. Uh, so what do we know about optic disc edema and paracapillary neovascular movement? I can tell you that when I was on call, I didn't know anything uh, prior to this. Um, but it's a fairly infrequent occurrence, but I think it's underreported in the literature, actually. After talking to some of the retina staff and them all mentioning that they've at least seen cases, uh, usually plural, um, in their clinics. Um, so it's an infrequent occurrence, like I said, in the literature, but I think that may be underreported. Um, a retrospective study basically looked at, from a tertiary referral center, looked at the incidence of IIH patients referred to them that had paracapillary neovascular membranes and they found an incidence of 0.53%. So fairly rare even in tertiary referral centers. Um, in the literature itself from 1970 <coughs> to 2010, um, there's been 23 cases of adults um, presented in the literature um, and they've attempted about everything you can imagine. So a lot of this was prior <coughs> to the advent of Avastin. So we've um, attempted just lowering ICP, which has shown that it will actually cause the peripapillary neovascular membrane to involute by just lowering ICP. We've done PDT and argon laser. I'd say we as an ophthalmology community, not me myself. I was 
this before. Yeah. Um, <laughs> then we've tried PEC and argon laser. Those have kind of fallen out of favor. Um, and optic nerve sheet fenestration has also been attempted um, that seem to work as well. Um, the exact mechanism of these treatments is not clear, um, but do seem to work. Um, then with the advent of anti vegf in 2009, the first peripapillary neovascular membrane um, related to IIH uh, was performed. Um, and with the single injection of anti vegf so a vast and complete regression of the neovascular membrane with this resolution of vision from basically count fingers to 2020 um, within six weeks of the injection. Unfortunately, there are some cases that are refractory that's not the majority, and the majority actually respond to a single of acid. Um, but there is a reported case out there that required four injections um, of anti-VEGF therapy with basically no effect on resolution of the subretinal fluid and also uh, return to baseline visual outcomes um, or visual acuity. So there are refractory cases, but for the most part, they seem to be exquisitely sensitive to even a single um, in the pediatric population, it's even more rare entities. So there have been two prior reported cases um, in the pediatric population. The first was actually described in 2010. Um, and for unclear reasons, um, but kind of similar to lowering ICP, uh, this patient only went, underwent a diagnostic lumbar puncture, but I guess it was also therapeutic uh, because they had complete involution of the peripapillary neovascular membrane with just the lumbar alone um, at initial diagnosis. Then the second case uh, was in 2013 um, due to, so the patient was started on Dimox to treat ICP, but due to worsening subretinal blood, uh, they elected after kind of an extensive conversation with the family about anti-VEGF therapy and the risks. Um, and kids uh, elected to perform a Vastin injection um, and noted the resolution of the neovascular membrane with a single avastin injection. Then if we look at just kind of some simple studies um, looking at neovascular membranes in the pediatric population, so there was a 10-year retrospective study um, looking at all the reported neovascular membranes at this specific center and the underlying etiology of those neovascular membranes. Um, they found 36 eyes, so fairly low numbers um, in the pediatric population. Um, at this institute, but none were related to optic disc edema. 47% um, were related to inflammatory conditions, so some sort of EVA phenomenon. Um, and then, just to kind of put this in there, because this is also um, important in the differential, especially these presentations, 8% were from optic nerve head drusen. Um, and so, um, a fairly rare entity, and maybe even more rare in the pediatric population. Um, I still think, um, at least from the discussions I've had, some of the retina and even their ophthalmology staff is maybe underreported. Not quite as sure in a pediatric population. The mechanism um, of why this occurs in um, elevated intracranial pressure uh, disc edema is unclear, but there's kind of two hypotheses, and most individuals think it's a combination of. Um, but the first is that there's a disruption of Brooks, Brooks membrane that is basically resultant from disc edema uh, that then allows ingrowth of vessels from the chorea capillaris. Uh, then that's um, kind of the other side of that um, hypothesis is that due to uh, disc edema, there's this chronic kind of axonal swelling along the optic nerve uh, that leads to a hypoxic environment, VEGF production, and then subsequent neovascularization, causing the parapapillary neovascular membrane. Um, most people that have published on this would say that this only seems to occur in chronic optic nerve edema, um, and their rationale for that is uh, kind of the following. So if they look at patients that present with peripapillary neovascular membranes in the setting of IIH, 50% of them will deny any sort of headache history, similar to our patient. So they're at least hypothesizing that these patients aren't undergoing the normal IIH surveillance, aren't having their optic nerves evaluated, 
um, and therefore have chronic disc swelling, allowing the peripatellar neovascular membrane um, to grow um, from this kind of chronic optic nerve swell. The other 50% of patients, um, uh, that's just their thoughts. I, I don't know that that ex necessarily explains it all. Um, but then that's kind of further supported by um, a study that looked at um, all of their peripapillary neovascular membrane patients in long-standing IIH. And it seemed to be that patients that they had followed for two to nine years, so kind of extensive follow-up for IIH, they never really saw um, peripapillary neovascular membranes occur until kind of late with chronic disc swelling. Um, and so that's kind of their um, rationale for kind of um, this chronic disc swelling being the underlying etiology. Um, and so um, that's at least peripapillary neovascular membranes related to IIH. There's a lot of other things that cause peripapillary neovascular membranes. Um, I, of course, didn't talk about those, but um, that's um, at least something we need to be aware of because, like I've already mentioned, I think it's much more common than maybe even the literature supports. Um, and it's something that we can do something about. Um, um, so, any thoughts or questions? And I guess before we get to that, uh, Cooper has already begun surveillance, or I've already begun surveillance <laughs> for peripapillary neovascular membranes. So don't worry. Uh, um, any questions, thoughts, concerns? Yes, Dr. Olson. So, if you think about the fact that uh, it was exquisitely sensitive to uh, VEGF inhibitors, it's hard to imagine that the uh, theory that this is largely mechanical. Right. It makes sense. And there, there's obviously got to be upregulation of VEGF. Right. And if you think about the anatomy, you could imagine the swelling of the rest of it. Some area of localized VEGF increase resulting in this has certainly got to be yeah. I mean, part of this overall. VEGF has to be a key molecule in this process. Well, right? that sensitive. So, yeah. so uh, the other thing is, is that if we're talking about how common is this, I mean, there could be small localized areas, and if they never break and bleed, Right. And then the, they get their, you know, their, their pseudo tumor treated, right. and if resolved, obviously, it, I mean, and that makes sense. If you're getting rid of some of that swelling, then whatever localized mechanical issue is causing localized ischemia, there may be a lot of these. And we just right. never look, and it could be the issue that Bob Hoffman loves, loves to say always about W and L often means on a gentleman's end we never look. That's right. And this may be an example. So <laughs> I would suggest this could be an interesting study. I don't just think, but let's just take everyone who comes in who maybe has had intracranial, you know, has had hypertension, a pseudo tumor for a period of time, and just do OCTs and look. And they, there may be small cell membranes way more often than we think. Yeah, and what I had didn't mention. Yeah, it'd be just a very interesting study because, like right. you said, there's not much there, but uh, we may find there are asymptomatic small ones that are there on a you know, much more frequent basis. Right. Um, and what most groups will also mention is that a lot of these chronic disc edema patients don't present until they have significant vision decline, and that's usually due to encroachment of subretinal blood uh, into the macula and underneath the fovea. Fascinating. So, uh, yeah, it's, uh, I think it's, like I said, and Dr. Olson also underreported in something of, of interest. Yeah, Dr. Terry. Very nice, Chris. Uh, just a question. Your view of the literature about optic disc bruising and subretinal vascularization parapapillary, did you get a number on that at all? Yeah, so at least the in the pediatric population, I didn't specifically look at adults, uh, but this very, very small study mentions that 8% of parapapillary neovascular membranes seem to be associated with optic nerve. Injuries. And that was pediatric. As a pediatric, pediatric population. And like I said, I mean, this study, I mean, there are 36 patients, so I mean, this could be much higher, much lower. Um, but that's literally the literature on peripapillary neovascular membranes in the pediatric population. I didn't specifically look at the adult population, but um, at least from a quick kind of review, it looks fairly similar to that. Um, but um, yeah, so I don't know exact numbers. I guess around 10, just seeing lots of drusia, yeah. I just that's kind of a yeah. number. It's somewhere in that range of 5 to 15 percent. It's not, it's not large, but it's not something to. Is that you, Eileen? <laughs> yeah. I'd like to ask the neuro-ophthalmologist um, about the role of FA in uh, distinguishing papilledema from pseudo-papilledema. Uh, does lack of hyperfluorescence of the 
this? Like eliminate uh, papilledema or papillitis as a possibility? We absolutely, the, the axoplasmic kind of congestion really makes the nerve hot. And so when we're looking at pseudopapilledema, that's one of the things that we look for. It's just really hard to do FAs on everyone when we have such clinical exam findings that are obvious. But I, it, we could go back and, and do, if we're going to do a study uh, with OCTs, we could you know, add in FAs and also look. So Dr. Hall, Chris, this is great. You know, one of the things that we have trouble sorting out at times are the kids who have non-calcified optic nerve head drusen right. from chronic disc edema. And I'm wondering with these, you know, the, the asymptomatic, I don't have a headache kids who look like they have chronic disc edema, how many of those actually with treatment, I mean the nerves changed, whether they actually had buried drusen, and that's what, we know that's a, a cause of subrenal nevascular membranes around the disc. I mean the ones I've personally seen over the years, one that strikes out about 20 years ago was a little girl with chronic chronic inflammatory disc edema who had florid subretinal nevascular membranes unfortunately ultimately expired from her anti-inflammatory treatment mm -hmm. to try to control things right. uh, it was just a, an unmitigated disaster but these can be very difficult yeah very difficult to dissect I mean the one thing that kind of forced our hand was the opening pressure of 41 um, so at that point uh, we had to assume it was real right even without identifying yeah, no, I mean, you got it. elevated opening pressure, I think that's, that's different. But some of these, I, I wonder how rigorously things were sorted out in some of these reports. Uh, so that report of 36 patients, I would not say that that's the most rigorous uh, study that I've ever seen. Uh, there you go. I mean, it, they have something out there, right? right. Um, so that's better than nothing, but it wasn't the most rigorous um, study. So, looks like we need it. Okay, well. Um, so, any other questions?